student to be at Oregon State University. And Neil Hammerschlag and I have been trying to pull together this, this loose group of people affiliated with the Marine Biodiversity Observing Network uh, to think about underwater sound. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Tyak, who will be speaking to us today under his um, International Quiet Ocean Experiment hat. Peter's a pioneer in the field of acoustic communication and social behavior of marine mammals and underwater acoustics. And honestly, the, the breadth and depth of his expertise means that it could take the entire hour we have set aside for me to properly introduce him. But briefly, um, Peter remains at Woods Hole, but before he went to Scotland, he spent nearly three decades at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, where he not only helped establish that humpback whale song is a reproductive display produced by males, uh, that dolphins have signature whistles, and he helped develop the DTAG, which has continued to revolutionize our understanding of the dive and acoustic behavior of marine mammals. For the past decade, he's been a professor at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, where he's really been tackling issues of human noise on the ocean and its impact on marine mammals, uh, especially beaked whales, and has been a co-chair of the science committee, which leads the implementation of the IQOE science plan. Uh, Peter's been an advisor to the National Research Council Ocean Studies Board, the Marine Mammal Count Commission, and is a fellow of the Acoustical Society of Oceanography uh, of America, the Center for Climate and Ocean Research, and most recently, the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, again, I'm leaving out many, many, many of his accomplishments. Uh, I should also say that many of Peter's students and mentees are now leaders in the field of bioacoustics. And we are incredibly fortunate and grateful to have him present to us today. So with that, I will turn it over to Peter and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kate, for that uh, gracious uh, introduction. As you can see, my, I will be speaking about topics a little bit outside of my field. And part of what I find wonderful about ocean science is uh, the ability to form teams with people to, to work outside of our fields and to have a, a broad point of view. So again, many of you may know more about one of the topics I'm talking about than me. If you have questions or alternate points of view, again, please feel free to interrupt because I think the discussion is what's most helpful. But I thought I would start uh, with a, oops, let's see, I'm screen sharing, there we go. Start with just a brief outline. I'm gonna talk about the origins of the International Quiet Ocean Experiment. Then I'll describe how it's broken into work themes and working groups. I'll then move along to discuss the ocean sound essential ocean variable, which I think will be quite important for the um, acoustic side of MBAN. Uh, then I'll talk about the efforts of IQOE moving towards standardizing acoustic measurements and a program of it that has just become available to follow the recommendations of most of the standardization workshops so that people with standard uh, audio files will be able to process them in a standardized way that will be uh, apples to apples across the, the other efforts people have made. And then in closing, I'll talk about my, at least my view and, and the view of the working group uh, from my QOE on the uses of passive acoustic monitoring to estimate biodiversity. I think it has some great promise, but it needs to be used carefully as a tool. So I'll give some of the caveats I see. And again, I, hopefully this will be the place where we can uh, kick off the most interesting discussion. The um, International Quiet Ocean Experiment was actually born from an offhand comment that Jesse Ausubel, who you may know in his role founding the Census of Marine Life, made at an Ocean Studies Board meeting of the National Academy, when people were discussing the impact of intense exposures to sound like sonar or air guns. And he said, well, what, might, what would happen if the whole planet went, uh, if the ocean went silent with no shipping noise for a day? And uh, this, this insight that we aren't doing very well at looking for slow chronic effects of noise and the, that we may be vulnerable to shifting baselines was part of what led to this name, the quiet ocean experiment. I spent most of my career doing short-term noisy transient experiments. And I was quite taken by Jesse's idea. I think it's been a missing piece of our science. So this initial idea germinated through a, a couple of small groups and was really initiated at 2011 in a very broad, large open science meeting at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris that was uh, sponsored by the Scientific Committee on Ocean, Oceanic Research and the Partnership for Observation of the Global Oceans, 
both of which have been really important uh, oversight groups for IQOE the whole time. After four years, we published a science plan, which has quite a bit of detail and is downloadable at the site you see down below. And the IQOE was envisioned as a 10 year activity to coordinate existing and new national activities focused on the topics identified in the IQOE science plan. Part of the concern we had around this time around 2010 was that a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of concern was going into effects of sound and ocean acoustics, but it was very balkanized. The communities working with air guns weren't talking to the communities concerned about sonar, the bioacousticians weren't communicating well with the physical acousticians, and uh, people from different countries and different regulatory regimes weren't communicating very closely across uh, boundaries. So we really wanted to push an international across both di discipline and across boundary effort. And Jesse had had experience with a census of marine life as uh, viewed as a, a fixed term effort to sort of kickstart uh, a, a, a new initiative. One of the kinds of things that uh, the IQOE did quickly was establish an inventory of moored civilian hydrophone arrays uh, you may be familiar with military hydrophone arrays. These were some of the first uh, arrays whose capability opened the eyes of those of us who saw them. But it's essential for modern science to have open access to data. So we focused on uh, more civilian hydrophones. And this map of the, the array we have up to date to 2021 highlights some huge gaps. You can see that there are dots in coastal waters around North America, uh, Europe, but most of the oceans are empty, with the exception of the blue dots, which are the hydroacoustic stations of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. They spent a lot of time and money uh, citing deep uh, hydrophone uh, arrays in the deep ocean in sites with clear uh, uh, lines of travel for to cover most of the oceans. So in this case, the goal was to have 11 sites where if, if a nuclear bomb was let off anywhere in or near the deep ocean, a signal from that, an acoustic signal would be picked up at these 11 sites. And uh, they've provided very uh, useful calibrated data. The other sites show clearly we need a huge amount of effort. We may not have full knowledge of the Southern Hemisphere uh, listening stations, and there are clearly are many around the areas of Asia that are blank here, but many of those are military and may not be open for open access for scientists. So this was the, an initial look we had. As I mentioned, the other key area that um, we focused on in terms of new efforts to look at the effects of sound on marine life were to study uh, the, the chronic effects of both increasing and also reducing noise in marine ecosystems. So the site one would be the key uh, schematic here of a key uh, insight of this uh, effort was if you look at a site like Rotterdam Harbor or uh, LA Harbor, they, they may very well already have so much shipping noise and so much noise that they're exerting negative impacts. And if we just keep adding noise to that to impacts that have already happened, we may not have a very sensitive assay of the impact that, that, added, that additional noise is having it may be more powerful to reduce the noise and see if things get better. And the overall experimental design here was a site control design where if in one site you have uh, high levels of noise and you have three sites that are pretty similar ecologically, you might move the source from site one to site two. So the sound level would decrease in site one and increase in site two. And you'd have a control site with no change in sound level to control for effects of other factors. This kind of study has been done for humans. So for example, in Germany, uh, before uh, the airport was moved from near the city of Munich to a rural site, people studied the people living near the airport in the city and also in the farming area where the, where the airport would be moved. And many um, pro learning problems, stress-related problems and diseases moved with the noise of the airport, providing some, some evidence with the idea that uh, chronic exposure to this kind of noise can have significant health effects in humans. And our, our goal was to apply this kind of study design to uh, wildlife. The 10 year plan, the scope of it, the science plan was published in 2015, uh, kicking off this. The idea was that there'd be planning for a few years, funding applications for a large effort for an international year of the quiet ocean to look at some of these large scale experiments. 
and then analysis and finding conclusions as the time went on, it's proved almost impossible to, to uh, control, to develop control of ocean noise to, to the extent that envisioned by Jesse in his initial experiment. There are several places, for example, where shipping lanes are being moved. There's a very interesting one in the North Sea where there's a proposal to look at that kind of impact. But it turns out we think that the most promising uh, year of the quiet ocean was not an intentional experiment, but the decrease in economic activity induced by COVID-19 around the planet. And uh, Jesse Asabel, Jen Mixis and I with Ed Urban did publish a paper in EOS about measuring ambient sound during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the table here just lists a slew of papers that have already come out to cover this topic. So there's a lot of work going on in a lot of sites to try to assess uh, what was the impact of changes in both roadway traffic and shipping traffic on exposure to uh, noise in the ocean and what might the impact have been on marine life. I'd like to just give an example uh, here of some of the complexities of making this kind of measurement. You can't just take a measurement from uh, spring of 2018, spring of 2019, spring of 2020 and compare a few numbers. This uh, is from a paper by uh, the NPL, National Physical Lab Group in uh, the UK on a statistical method for looking for long-term trends. This, this um, show, the dots show monthly noise data from one of the CTBTO hydrophones in deep water off Cape Lewin on the west coast of Australia. And you should be able to see very pronounced seasonal changes. And on top of the, the black line is a curve fit through the data. And it shows a, a, about um, 4 dB of, of swings just due to the seasonal changes and perhaps 2 dB uh, of interannual trends in a time series that goes from 2003 to 2017. And the kind of question we have to ask about was there an impact of COVID uh, quieting was, uh, are, are there are outliers, are, are the dots down there? In this case, this doesn't have to do with COVID. These are actual real outliers in the noise data from Cape Lewin. Are those uh, dots that are below the model between around 2015 and 2016, are those statistically significant deviations from the trend expected based upon pre-COVID uh, uh, modeling? And uh, Stephen Robinson and his group at NPL are analyzing data from three of the CTBO sites using this kind of modeling right now and do have evidence of uh, this kind of quietening in some of the sites, but not in all of them. But I hope this gives a sense of the complexity of what we really need to understand the broad long-term trends in noise in order to look at the impact of uh, what in this scale is a rather acute impact of a, a year, of, a season of, co of quieting from reduced economic activity from COVID. Uh, that stops my introduction uh, in general for the structure of the plan and some of the goals we have. The science plan organized the IQE around three different work themes. One was ocean soundscapes. Uh, this was uh, meant to study ambient sound and the components of different soundscapes how to model soundscapes by using knowledge about sources and how sound is propagating in that environment. And also explicitly what might be the influence of climate change. So our consciousness about the broad annual and decadal changes uh, due to climate change and other cyclical uh, ocean changes uh, led us feel, to feel that it was very important to establish good measurements on decadal plus timescales to have the kind of insight that the Keeling curve gave us in terms of uh, atmospheric CO2. It was also important to uh, look at the effects of sound on marine life. Uh, we did focus quite a bit on experimental methods establishing functions relating acoustic expo exposure to responses uh, to effects of, of both acute and chronic noise and including these reductions of noise. There's a working uh, theme about observing ocean sound which focuses on the methods on uh, what acoustic observation networks are out there, but about data collection, including standards, calibration of the hydrophones, quality control of the data, data management and open access of the data. I won't talk about it too much here, but there are significant data management uh, problems here. Acoustic uh, data yields uh, 
many terabytes of data for many of these observatories. And I don't think that any nation has really done a very good job of uh, establishing a good controlled uh, open access system for managing the, the data that we are getting from ocean uh, soundscapes today. It also focused on biological observing systems, but I'll talk a little bit towards the end about the, the uh, sp specific focus we've had about that with acoustics. There's also a focus on industry and regulation uh, to help integrate and apply the results of the research to managing the risk of underwater sound by defining harm thresholds and developing methods to monitor noise and effects within regulatory regimes. Again, I won't talk too much about that in, in this talk because it didn't seem quite as relevant, but if people have questions, feel free to ask. Part of the idea, again, was to take a global uh, view internationally and across all stakeholders and researchers to try to help improve communication in this area, which has often been quite politicized. There were four working themes that turned into several um, working groups and an implementation committee. I'll talk about the ocean sound, um, uh, essential ocean variable later. The IQOE sponsors an implementation committee to develop this uh, essential ocean variable. There's an Arctic acoustic environment working group, which aims to produce an acoustic baseline for testing about future sound increases as, as ice changes in the ocean, as climate changes, and as following that, uh, human activity may increase in the Arctic. The data management and access working group develops data management uh, and data access policies for scientists and data centers. It has not had funding to do its own development. It's just been working to develop this with other nations. And the ocean, there's an ocean acoustic and marine bioacoustic standardization working group. And they've been developed to make acoustic measurements more compatible and more comparable. And they recommend best practices for experiments, observation, reporting, and other means to ensure that results are comparable and can be integrated for standardizing data across the large spatial and long time scales that IQOE thinks is so important. And finally, and most relevant to MBON, there's an acoustic measurement of ocean biodiversity hotspots that aims to develop the potential to monitor sound continuously at high diversity ocean areas to help characterize and understand biodiversity. So I'll spend the, the end of the talk going into uh, at least my view. I'll, I'll describe the paper that this group has come up with and then my view of the topic. Uh, just for a brief introduction to the ocean sound essential ocean variable, the partnership uh, for uh, ocean global observations develop, uh, supported an IQOE working group to develop this ocean sound essential ocean variable. I hadn't really heard about this uh, uh, strange structure. The global ocean observing system uh, sets up requirements for global ocean observing and you, the governments that will fund the systems can't fund something unless an ocean sound, unless an essential ocean variable has been established for that variable. So in order to establish it, you have to describe what are the societal drivers and pressures that require, make a requirement for this. Uh, the measurements that this um, variable calls for is waveforms, time waveforms of sound pressure, and also particle motion, either displacement, velocity, or acceleration. Those of you who are familiar with um, hearing of marine organisms know that most marine organisms actually detect particle motion. So if we are to understand the sound field as they experience it, particle motion is very important and it's poorly sampled by human sensors. This is an area that needs more effort. Uh, the ocean sound essential ocean variable covers all platforms and systems, cabled systems, moored systems, autonomous drifting systems, even acoustic recording tags on animals. And the, it, the, the variable effort also focuses on standardization and archiving of data. And as I mentioned, IQOE leads the implementation plan. This is not just a biology essential ocean variable, it's a cross-discipline one with physics. The, obviously, what we are measuring here is a physical parameter, the pressure waveform or particle motion, but it's critical for measuring a large number of uh, biological um, uh, variables as well. Looking at the actual uh, document describing the ocean sound essential ocean variable, I list uh, in the Goose website a, 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 a site where you can download the, the document. Here's probably a little easier way to, to envision 
what the ocean sound EOV is about within the context of ocean acoustics. If you just look at the center where I show ocean acoustics, on the left uh, it are uh, applications of active acoustics in which the instrument produces sound itself and listens for echoes. On the right is passive acoustic monitoring where you're just listening to, natural, to sources of sound in the ocean. And the top uh, bar of this figure shows biological variables, plankton, fish, backscatter, invertebrates, fish, marine mammals. And the ones indicated in red are biology or ecology essential ocean variables. So most of the biology ones are very focused on a taxonomic group, measurements of fish, measurements of marine mammal abundance, measurements of plankton. Uh, for the, uh, if you look down below on the bottom row, that's physical variables and the physics essential ocean variables are indicated in red there. So active acoustics uh, can be used in a depth sounder to measure bathymetry, subsurface height, subsurface temperature, subsurface currents, sea ice to the right, sea state, waves and wind, you can get from listening. You can also get sea ice cover from passive listening. Uh, passive listening is also useful for measuring earthquakes and tsunamis and rain in the physical domain. Uh, none of the essential ocean variables are focused on measuring human activities, but passive acoustic monitoring has been used extensively for monitoring for nuclear explosions, uh, for listening for military sonar, seismic surveys, and ship noise. And obviously, sonars and seismic survey are active acoustic uh, tools that are used to search for submarines or uh, sub, sur sub seafloor uh, geological deposits. The ocean sound EOV is limited to passive acoustic monitoring, partly because we're focused on this long time scale, broad spatial scale. So there's a little bit of a, of a, a gap, although active acoustics will play a, a really important role for the biology and ecology EOVs for plankton and fish. I, I don't know if there are any other questions about this. It's a little complicated structure. So goose, is about uh, each, every one of these red variables, and there are more of them, are, are, uh, groups have argued to the Global Ocean Observing System that, that it's essential to have measurements of these uh, variables in the ocean. And that frees up money for the observing system to support build, building technology and networks and observatories for making those measurements. It's ironic to me as an acoustician that ocean sound, which is the primary distance sense in the ocean, had been lacking. All of these other uh, essential ocean variables had been there much longer, but it was the cross-cutting uh, use of sound, that it's a physical variable that's so important for understanding both biological and physical parameters that we think left the community out, out of this. And IQOE has worked quite hard to pull all of the ocean acoustics community together to, to sort of help but, uh, get recognition for the importance of measuring ocean sound to understand the oceans. Peter, just a question on, on this diagram. Yes. Just the red box on the right-hand side, uh, it, it says ocean sound EOV, but obviously maybe I'm misinterpreting that red box. The ocean sound EOV only includes passive acoustic monitoring. And it includes passive acoustic monitoring for measuring other essential ocean variables like the red fish, red marine mammals, red sea state, red sea ice, and the ones in black, like invertebrates like snapping shrimp that had not been, in, been talked about as part of observing, and for measuring human activities, which we view as a very important uh, element of measuring stressors in the ocean, but had been ignored by goose, and uh, earthquakes and tsunamis and rain which also are important um, uh, both from a human safety perspective, but rain may also be an important consequence of, ch of uh, climate change that had not been indicated, uh, been included here. And, and just to clarify, and, and be, because of the way the ocean sound EOV was structured and because of the way IQOE was structured, looking over these long spatial and time scales, it does not include active acoustics. And that's the way it's going to stay. Uh, I think it, I think that's something that people could argue. The group, the the, the uh, groups that were involved in the initial formation of the EOV uh, were focused primarily on passive acoustic monitoring, and most of the bio eco 
uh, people who are interested in precision echo sounders, we're focused on very narrow beam, very high frequency, narrow ship sort of ship or, plant or uh, AUV based measurements that seemed not in the same scale. I, but I think this is, this is something where if there's strong support from the active acoustic community, that's possible. The one group that has pushed for more involvement has been the acoustic tomography group. And there's been pushback from the, um, the, the, some of the bioeco group that, um, that they're anxious about being involved in, in the use of very loud uh, sound sources that have already been shown to have negative consequences on marine life as an inherent part of the essential ocean variable. Okay, we can come back to this uh, in the discussion, I guess. Yeah, I think it's a very, that's the reason I, I, I made this diagram was to try to highlight the fact that, that active acoustics is, it, it's not that it isn't used for measuring the other essential ocean variables, but it doesn't stand out as its own as something that where it's really important to gather those materials in general. I think the other difference for passive acoustic monitoring is, for example, the comprehensive test ban treaty organization data, which go back 20 years now, were funded and designed to listen for nuclear explosions, a, a function that's not even included in Goose at all. But those long-term records are incredibly useful for for anybody interested in any of the other parameters that are within the ocean sound EOV. So the, the, the place where I think another place where it might be important to focus on active acoustics is are there many cases where active acoustics provide a uh, long time to provide uh, data records that aren't really focused on answering a specific question like backscatter from plankton and fish or midwater organisms or sea surface height or temperature occurrence, but that we're maintaining a long-term archive would be useful for a, a very broad range of applications, so much so that it should have its own separate essential ocean variable. It's a really good topic for discussion because uh, you, know, you, you see there's a, there's a gap here. Why don't I move on and then we can pick this up if there's further interest because I think it is important in terms of um, estimates of biodiversity. This is just a list of three workshops that the IQOE was involved in to inventory existing standards for observations of sound. That was um, 2014, if I remember correctly. Uh, a workshop to develop guidelines for observation of ocean sound that was held in 2018, published in 2019. And another inventory of existing standards and guidelines that are specifically relevant to bioacoustics. And I have um, links to all of the documents that if you're interested in, in those. These, this just gives, it's a little hard to read, but this gives you a sense of the processing standards that are recommended by each workshop. So the three bottom rows are recommendations of the three workshops. And let me just summarize that basically they all agreed that if you want to characterize ambient noise in the ocean over long time periods, you should sample at least a minute every hour and probably better to go up to about five minutes per hour, uh, but you, can, you don't need to sample continuously. That hour, that, that, the chunk though, should have at least 30 second contiguous, 30 to 60 seconds of contiguous recording time so that you can do FFTs for frequency analysis. The temporal averaging window for measuring percentiles of sound pressure level. So the idea is here is you measure chunks, you measure chunks of sound so you get a um, time series of a minute or so, and you will get a, a sound pressure level by frequency for each of those chunks. And then the goal is to establish what is the distribution of those noise levels by frequency uh, over time and place. So the temporal unit for getting the statistics, the minimum uh, was viewed as a day, optimum might be about a month, and seasonal up, seasonal up to a year would be important for integrating the data. But once, the, once these chunks of a minute or so are sampled uh, and averaged, then you, the, the rest can, these are, are just processing uh, guidelines. Uh, the SBL percentiles, the, the typical description has been to measure 10, 25, 50, 75, 90 percentiles. So the 50th percentile would be the median sound pressure level measured at a frequency, within a frequency band. Uh, for one of these uh, data sets. 
And the frequency analysis bandwidth was basically set to about a third octave uh, uh, band. And the idea was the total, total frequency bands for a global perspective where, lo where you're looking over long ranges should be about 10 Hertz to one kilohertz. And these standards were then implemented by in a program called Manta. This is an open access, freely available uh, signal processing tool, uh, which is available at the Bitbucket, Bitbucket site listed here for anybody in the ocean, in the acoustics community to implement the technical recommendations of those workshops so that they can enable valid comparison between soundscapes and identify ambient ocean sound trends required by ocean stakeholders. And one of the key elements here is I think one of the things that's harmed the trust of uh, some people looking at ocean acoustics is that different groups will make different measurements uh, to suit their own, uh, their own needs. And having a standardized apples to apples approach that's put forward by a neutral community uh, was very important. And it's also designed to enhance the value of individual data sets that anybody may gather in any site by providing a mechanism to create these comparable data sets over time to ultimately to assess ocean sound at a global level. Uh, it, was, it was developed by a working group of international experts, both in academia, industry, and government. I'm, I am not talking too much about, about the data management side, but the German um, research uh, uh, government funding agencies for the German government have funded the Alfred Wegener Institute to establish a, a database there called Opus, which can integrate, it can take in MANTA data directly. And so for their uh, scientists, they, they have a database for this. And I, I would argue that it would be very important for other nations or other groups that are, will take on the responsibility of um, archiving and curating these data to uh, either use MANTA or make sure that they have a, a similar uh, apples to apples uh, way to store the data. Many nations like uh, particularly India, for example, will not release uh, raw data that are taken within their economic zone. But once the data are processed to noise statistics, that also makes it easier for open access. So that's another, another element. From the IQOE perspective, if we wanna track ocean noise, these noise statistics are the critical data set. So once you know you have a good calibrated data chain leading to these, these should be the kind of data that would be open access and easier to access than raw waveforms. Uh, okay, so I, that's the, I'm gonna switch now to acoustic measurement of ocean biodiversity. I don't know if people have questions about the noise measurements. Uh, um, Kate had requested something on that. This, this is an area that we focused on very strongly from the very beginning of IQOE. And I think we've moved, uh, we, we've really achieved our, our goals other than seeing uh, pretty broad international accessibility for, for submitting these standardized data, but developing the standards get from, a, from a broad international group and then having a program to implement them were two of our major goals for that. If we look at acoustic measurement of ocean biodiversity, this, the, this um, working group was a bottom-up effort. Many of, of the IQOE community were very interested in this topic and formed uh, a working group uh, right around the time that the science plan came ahead. And they have pu published in 2020 a paper in Royal Society Open Science called Listening Forward, Approaching Marine Bi Di Biodiversity Assessments using acoustic methods. And I, I'm just summarizing what I view as a couple of the critical points. They point out that conventional marine survey methods for biodiversity, things like visual survey or photographic or video surveys were adapted from traditional terrestrial me methods, where for example, you could put a quadrat down on a, a piece of land and count the number of animals from every species. But unlike the terrestrial situation, they allow only for intermittent assessments of biodiversity and are only achievable when the sites can be assessed. So weather, depth, remoteness may make it difficult. Uh, conditions have to be amenable to visual observation and may bias the results. So they pointed out problems with the standard methods. They reviewed the, uh, the extensive effort both in terrestrial ecosystems and the smaller amount in uh, marine ecosystems about acoustic diversity metrics. 
And they pointed out that the idea that a, a, a measure of acoustic diversity might be useful as a biodiversity metric really depends on the assumption that when species acoustic signals have distinct characteristics like frequency, amplitude, duration, or repetition rate, that species specificity can allow for discrimination of species and maybe sex and other behaviors. And there are some terrestrial studies that suggest that soundscape complexity, uh, a, a, an information complexity score derived just from uh, uh, acoustic recordings, that that may increase with species richness. But the paper concludes that no clear methods seem successful to extract biodiversity data from marine acoustic recordings and applications of even an array of the terrestrial acoustic diversity indices seem ineffective. So it's very positive about, about uh, that we need to try to develop these kinds of indicators to make up for some of the short um, falls of the normal terrestrial approaches, but, but the, cur the current state of the art does not support uh, good measurements of ocean biodiversity. And I just point out, now I'm gonna to switch to my voice as opposed to describing the paper. My read is that, and I'd love feedback from you because different people mean different things by biodiversity. This really isn't my field. But when I look at biodiversity indices, almost all of them require measurements of the number of individuals of each species within some defined spatial region and time. So species richness only, only requires an estimate of the number of species. But all of the other measures that I indicate on this um, uh, figure indicate estimates of the number of individuals of each species. And that's quite a, a tall um, data requirement. And even th there's significant questions about bias with even the simplest terrestrial systems with some of the visual kinds of, of observation measurements. What we do know passive acoustic monitoring can do is in specific circumstances, circumstances, passive acoustic monitoring can estimate the density and abundance of vocalizing animals. So in this case, you are not making sounds. You're just, the only way you detect an animal is by listening to sounds they make. And th this um, work, uh, which comes from, is described in the paper I list below, comes from a standard distance sampling method that's also been used for visual detection of animals. In this case, you define that the estimate of the density of the species you're interested in comes from the number of cues that you've detected and, and categorized to that species divided by the probability of detecting a cue within a specific area and uh, times that area times the uh, call rate so that the call rate converts the number of cues to number of individuals. So we've got number of cues on the top the probability is probability of detecting a cue within the unit area, and the rate is dividing cues by individuals. So that gives you individuals per unit area once you uh, solve, all, you know, solve all those um, elements of the equation out. But the method requires detecting calls from various stations. It requires estimating the probability that you're detecting the call as a function of range in order to get that P value. And also it requires measuring the call rates of different individuals so that you can convert the number of cues that you've detected to the number of individuals. And it only works for taxa where the calls are taxon specific. So for example, for porpoises, which scarcely a minute goes by when a porpoise won't make an echolocation click and where these very narrow band high frequency clicks of the phocenids are quite distinctive uh, or for beaked whales, which also have quite distinctive echolocation clicks and make them every time they do a deep foraging dive, this method has been shown to give quite good estimates of the density of animals. And in both those cases, porpoises and beaked whales are very cryptic and extremely difficult to, to use sighting surveys to get these estimates. If you have the capability of passive monitoring, I would argue that uh, the passive monitoring is a much more robust uh, measure for that for these species. Uh, but for animals, for example, like the, the range of, for low frequency animals like daily whales, the range of detection can be farther for acoustic detection than visual, which might seem to be a big positive. But estimating the area of detection is more difficult in that case, unless there's precise acoustic estimation of range. So for example, if you think about uh, finback calls, even uh, North Pacific right whale calls, and you get a call rate, the, the, the estimate of the density and abundance of those animals really matters 
if you think you can detect those calls at a range of a few tens of kilometers versus hundreds of kilometers. And that really has to be solved in detail for these estimates to work well. So this is an area that I'm very confident about and feel that there are specific areas where this is very helpful for estimating population abundance of some populations. But in many taxa, and I'm more familiar with marine mammals, so I'll give a marine mammal example, fish are very similar. Identification of calls to species can be really problematic. So here's a study by Julie All Oswald in 2004. Uh, recent ones may get a little bit better, but the point is similar. That looks at a confusion matrix of whistles, which whistles were recorded from a group of dolphins of known species. So each whistle, because of the visual sighting, they knew what species made it. And then they developed a classifier to try to, to, to classify the whistles to species based just on the acoustic information. And for some animals like bottlenose dolphins and false killer whales, they were 80% successful. That's pretty good. That might form the basis of uh, species identification for biodiversity estimates. But look at the others, 50%, 15%, 26%. I don't think that, um, I wouldn't trust uh, data on passive acoustic data on whistles, which were classed as species to form the basis of a biodiversity index, even just for delphinids, because of this, the problems with classification. And many fish, I think this is, this is a similar problem. This is my, the only slide I'll include on active acoustic methods, because I think they're so important for marine biodiversity estimates. Uh, some active acoustic methods with uh, precision scientific echo sounders can estimate individuals. If you look at the echogram on the left, there are some of those dots look small enough and, and discrete enough that they may be individuals. But even with multi-frequency data, one seldom can identify species based upon the echoes. So on the right-hand plot is the uh, difference in the scattering strength for the different frequency pairs, 18 kilohertz versus 32 kilohertz, 70 versus 38, for the different uh, species that are listed in the, in the key on the bottom. And some, like the red euphausids or the green mctophids, might be able to be discriminated from the others on the basis of the differences in amount of energy reflected back with the different frequencies. But among the, cent the central ones, that would be uh, much harder, much more difficult to do. So I, again, this isn't really my area, but the, but the extent to which I've seen data from precision echo sounders would suggest to me, they really require ancillary data on species identification in order to really provide a robust estimate of biodiversity, the number of individuals of different species, which at least for me is the core of estimating biodiversity. So I'll get back to passive acoustic monitoring of biodiversity, the pros, are we really in place for getting persistent, continuous, replicable data over decadal scales? That's a huge plus. And I don't know of many uh, visual time series that feel as robust over this kind of very long time scale. It allows long range detection for low frequency sounds. And that has enabled discovery of unknown aggregations in the ocean of spawning coniferous fish and of calling whales. So there's an area where we, we can learn where to look with other, our other methods, that's very important. And it also has different biases compared to the other methods used to estimate biodiversity. And I think given the strength of the biases and the unwillingness of the different communities who use one method to really think too hard about their biases, I think the different methods are very important. In the cons, I don't think that there are many species in which we can confidently identify calls to species using the acoustic data alone and even fewer species call at all. So they're not represented in bioacoustic estimates of diversity at all. And estimating density and abundance of, known, of animals, uh, species whose calls can be identified does require additional precise knowledge of sound propagation and calling rates of individuals. So I feel that this is super important. It's something that's very important to be developed, but I would say it's best as a carefully targeted complement to other methods like visual eDNA to estimate biodiversity. DNA is interesting because if done correctly, DNA should be very precise at estimating the species that it comes from, but it has other problems in its, in its estimate. So in Kate's initial email to me, I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing a, a recommendation that my view and my summary is that I think 
looking at the scope of what I've seen from IQOE and other communities working on this, I think a really important contribution of MBON, the MBON effort, would be to think uh, critically about biodiversity measures and how we can use the full array of different kinds of measures available to get um, good, es effective estimates of biodiversity and how it changes over long time scales. So thanks, and I'm happy for uh, questions or discussion. Oh, thanks so much, Peter, for a very thoughtful and thought-provoking talk. Um, I had lots and lots of questions during your talk, but I would be interrupting every slide. Um, so I think you, you've highlighted some of the issues that we've really been struggling with in MBON. So what is a biodiversity measure with passive acoustics? How can we figure that out? And if you look at the scope of US MBONs, which range from the Arctic to the, tropic, to the tropics, as well as temperate areas, how do we begin to think about the different suites of species and sources of sound in these areas? And is there a way to, to come up with a measure, uh, come up with a way that we can compare different MBON regions? Um, I think that's one of the things that I've really been, been struggling with. And, and maybe, maybe we go back to thinking about acoustic metrics and then from there, move on to the biodiversity metrics. Great, yeah, I, I'd like to hear from other people too. I think my um, bias in here comes from being primarily an animal behavior person or organismal biologist, where I notice when I'm at sea and see a distant blow, it's hard to know what the hell species it is. And I'm super focused on, on quality of data and detail of data. so. Uh, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of being able to, you know, get a, 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 good diverse, a good diversity measure by itself. And all, looking at the papers, I'm a little, I'm, I, uh, maybe I'm just too, being too ambitious of, of tr asking the community to be too ambitious. But I would think the thing that I'd love to see would be to let acousticians, divers, uh, ROV people, eDNA people, all do their best in a couple of their sites, not with an idea that one site is right or the one is best. See, when you see the acoustic data compared to a potentially biased, very narrow visual assessment, I'm a little concerned. They, they don't match very well, but uh, and I and I'm uh, skeptical about how well the acoustic diversity index really captures, uh, you know. PI log PI, if the sum of PI log PI, if that really is the goal measure that we want to, that we want to look at, uh, because the visual stuff may be bad too. And maybe eDNA, if, it's, if, if you have at least 10 replicates of each species you're looking at, you may be able to get a sense of, have you fully covered all the species uh, you know, that might be contributing DNA to that water sample? maybe that gives you a, a better estimate of number of species you can go back and ask well are 90 percent of them so small no ecologist has ever thought about them before does that matter uh, i think i think for me i think I, I prefer starting with what's the fundamental definition of biodiversity what are the impoverished and biased methods that we have available to try to estimate it and then how can and try all of them and how can we combine them to, to get as close as possible? Yeah, one of the, I, I don't think she's on today, but Maria Cavanaugh has been working on something she calls seascapes, where she brings in a bunch of different measures of both the environment, but also the biodiversity and, and does a lot of work with, with satellite data. And I've been thinking how could we go from seascapes to soundscapes, but also include these, these measures of biodiversity? And you know, for the Arctic, it's relatively simple. It's not simple, but, but we know the species that make sound. We have a pretty good idea of who's making sound, and we have a, a relatively limited number of species, at least in the Chukchi Sea, where the Arctic Marine Biodiversity Observing Network node is. But for these other areas, um, particularly tropical areas, boy, I think it's gonna be a real challenge. Um, 
but I don't know, would somebody else like to, to jump in and, and add to that? Can we go from seascapes to soundscapes or should we even try? Yeah, I think Neil and Enrique may chime in also because that's one of our goals in the, at least in the Florida M1 project, that's exactly one of the things that we would like to do is kind of complement some of the measurements uh, with each other. So that, like you said, Peter, the complementarity of some of these is what's gonna give you a fuller picture and not just any one measure. And so we are working with Maria very in trying to improve the, or, or at least document what these seascapes mean. It's just basically a classification of a bunch of different satellite data. And we see that there are patterns that are repetitive over time and in space, and we wanna relate them to to different metrics of whatever lives in, in, in the water at different times. So uh, I don't know where Neil is uh, at the moment, but we are working, for example, in Biscayne Bay. Uh, it's a small area, but one of the ideas is to try to see whether changes in, in the satellite observables match changes in, in the soundscape. So it's a crude thing. So I, I don't think we're trying to identify a specific set of species that, uh, but just from a relative point of view, are things changing? You know, that's, that's to, to us a first zero order problem. If you have a long-term record, is anything changing, even if you don't know what it is? And then can you relate those changes to other variables and try to explain it? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. And maybe uh, biodiv the, uh, biodiversity as a label as such a big tent, it can include it. Uh, we, we've certainly had very strong interest at IQOE in the biodiversity working group from a lot of Indian scientists, where they say, we have so many coral reefs and so few marine ecologists, there's no way that we're gonna be able to use standardized methods. But we might be able to put sound recorders out for an hour in each of 10,000 reefs every year, say, and get an idea how many of them are active, how many are, are animals actually you know, calling, uh, are, you know, what, what's the activity going on. We know enough about coral reefs. We, we have no idea what the biodiversity is in terms of estimating the number, but we can have an acoustic uh, indicator for health of the reef compared to severe decline. And maybe it's also going to be helpful to be more specific about what the goals of the projects are, because I would also think for many commercially important fish and for baleen whales, uh, we actually probably can tell for codfish and haddock and some of the species that are uh, commercially very important, uh, if we had very good acoustic monitoring where their spawning sites were, we wouldn't be able to say what all the we wouldn't be able to say what the biodiversity was there, but that's a key key uh, gain for an applied management region. It's just a much it's just a narrower goal than than biodiversity itself. Um, this is Neil Hammerschlag. I, I have a question for Peter, and this is I guess also general for the the Embon group and. Peter, one of the things you point out is actually how you define biodiversity and, and how that factors in. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are to the group, but you in specific, you know, coming out with, you know, something um, as the more simple that, that, you know, more closely approaches richness versus biodiversity. So something that might look at, <clears throat> you know, overall sound pressure levels and the different frequencies, um, and looking at how those might be changing over time or spatially um, as some sort of proxy of just richness in general, obviously of the community that is that is making sounds. Um, so if you're working within the same region with similar biota per se, and you might be looking at for spatial differences, you know, like in our area in, as in Biscayne Bay, one of the things we will look at is for example, how <clears throat> the anthropogenic and uh, biological soundscape might vary in proximity to urbanization. So along a, an urban gradient from downtown Miami to, for example, into more pristine areas. So, you know, could we look at, you know, overall sound pressure levels and various frequencies that might, and over, you know, spatially and temporally, it might, you know, give us an indication of, 
you know, in addition, when you combine it with anthropogenic noise signals like boat traffic and other things, it might be a valuable, not as purely defined biodiversity in the sense of how, you know, you might define in a textbook, but at least as a proxy to some degree of, of, of richness, because richness, as I think, is, it a, is an important aspect of, it's probably the most important aspect of diversity per se, less so that the evenness, at least for some of the things that I think, you know, preserving, you know, rare species and other things. Yeah, again, I have my bias on this, but I think um, the, the way I think of soundscapes in that sense is that, and I think looking at the data on, on indicators is that it's very difficult to take just a broad frequency band and say, okay, that's gonna be an indicator of biological sounds. And this other one is gonna be an indicator of anthropogenic sounds, more so in the water than in air because uh, sound travels so well and there's so many intense sources of sound in, in the ocean and on the ocean. So I think my um, bias for this would be to say, I think it's important to select some indicator species like in, in that area, you know, some of the vocalizing fish, uh, you could choose dolphin whistles. They're almost certainly gonna be tersiops, maybe snapping shrimp, although we don't really know very well what are the, all the ecological requirements of them. And, and then have some separate uh, indicators of say recreational vessel passes, which are pretty easy to identify as transients. And then try to identify the interrelations between those uh, those different sources of sound once they've been identified, but to but to drop the the step of identifying what the source is and hope that average that an average frequency band will give us that signal. I, I'm pessimistic, and I think that the results of most of the of the early uh, marine acoustic indicator species uh, show that problems from anthropogenic noise or snapping shrimp just completely overwhelm anything else they're trying to measure. I, I I have some questions also, but there's a few people, I mean, Jim Locascio, there's a few people with ex, a lot of experience in measuring sound in coastal waters. I wonder if they have questions or some thoughts. Hi, Frank, can you hear me? This is Jim. Hi, Jim, how are you doing? Yeah. Good, thanks. Um, yeah, this, is a, this has been a very interesting um, discussion. And I think the point is being made and Peter explained it very well that the biodiversity equations weren't made for acoustic data. Um, that was a different method that was um, developed um, based on a data collection process that um, isn't really fair to how we collect, I think, and, and are able to interpret the acoustic data. So it's a, on the surface, it's easy to, I think, comprehend the application of it, but Peter pointed out a lot of great reasons as to why it is not entirely appropriate and could be, um, uh, could underrepresent uh, what's actually going on. Not all, an all animals exist, you can count them, but not all animals make sound and they don't all make sound all the time or on different, um, you know, periods, seasonally, daily, in groups of different sizes and so on. So. Um, <clears throat> I think as to Peter's point about indicators, you know, we have the dominant sound producers in coastal areas and in, in the West coast of Florida as cyanids. Um, and they dominate the acoustic environment and they do so very regularly and predictably on seasonal and daily scales. Um, to me, these animals represent a great opportunity to understand what the impact in these coastal systems are. They're higher trophic level, secondary productivity, um, and um, they're providing an important uh, ecological function, you know, re reproduction is the behavior. So associated with the sound. So focusing more on what those data can actually tell us instead of maybe um, trying to broadly uh, classify them into an indice and we have more specific information we can get from them, um, I think. Not to say the diversity isn't doesn't have a place. I don't. I think it does. And Kate was mentioning this too, and somebody else was. Um, Neil was mentioning this. You know, there's um, the amount of sound is going to be reflective overall. I think of the habitat quality uh, to some degree. We need to learn more about who's making all these. So snapping shrimp sounds. There's not just snapping shrimp. I don't think. Um, and then um, 
kind of build up from there. Um, we can make the measurements of the sound and the frequency bands. And as Peter was saying, you can hang your hat on one level and one frequency, whatever bin size you want. But, um, uh, you know, we may be overgeneralizing by doing it. Uh, th those would be, you know, those would be my thoughts. I, I think the idea of the biodiversity aspect is good, but maybe something more, more sensitive to how acoustic data are um, collected and measured and, and what the limitations of them are compared to what we think of as a traditional metric for biodiversity. Yeah, I think your idea of the cyanids is exactly the way I was thinking of choosing a sentinel species whose ecological role you understand. And even better when you understand what the function of the signaling is uh, to understand uh, you know, that that activity is going on. Then you understand, if you have that animal in ecological context and understand its role in the food web and the organisms it depends on and the organisms that depend on it, I think that's, you know, at least you're then getting a sense of the health of a, of a whole network within that ecosystem, if not an estimate of biodiversity overall. That, I think part of the problem may just be the naming. It may be better to, to be more focused on uh, using bioacoustics to estimate uh, you know, critical sentinel species that tell you more than just about the status of that one species, but about uh, the, the food web that it's embedded in. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I think the term biodiversity is too established in its own right. And um, borrowing it for this application is there's a little lost in translation, uh, <laughs> yeah. potentially, especially for people not coming from so much of an acoustics background. Yeah, this is a good point. We, we do use biodiversity in a very broad sense, as a word, very broad. Mm. Yeah. I, I don't know how we're doing with time, Kate and Neil. I think we are getting up. We, well, we are at the end of our hour. And uh, in trying to be respectful of people's time, um, we should probably bring this to a close. Uh, yeah. We'd like to. Again, even though we could talk for hours on this. Um, we could, like just to make a point uh, before we close, because I wanna get back to, and this is gonna be a separate conversation because Gabrielle was also uh, paying attention and perking her ears at your comment that uh, some people in the Goose Bio Eco panel uh, were not all that inclined to include active acoustics and so I, I think that we, we could and should revisit this conversation because I'm on that panel and I hadn't heard that. And I am very interested in maybe as a, as a companion metric, you can measure some things with one and one with another. And we need to start thinking about how we, how we complement measures, not just one thing. So I, that was one comment. And we didn't touch on it enough, I think, but there's a, 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 I mean, part of the MBON effort is standards for collecting data, for curating the data, and for produce, producing indicators. And that connection with indicators and making something useful with the data from a management point of view is something that we need to circle back to. So I, I hope you don't escape and you, you keep involved in this biosound group, Peter. So or we won't leave you alone with questions. <laughs> Great, yes, and I, I'm very clear that I think that the, there are many applications of marine bioacoustics for specific management problems uh, that are, have a much stronger foundation than an effort to, to estimate biodiversity, if that's, if, if that's the goal. So I think that's an area that deserves a, a, a lot of focus in, the, in this effort, because I think a lot of the societal drivers don't really care about that number. They care about specific policy issues that are very that for which sound is the best sense to sense the ocean. Yeah, and that's what that's the way we should look at this conversation. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, let's let's end for today, and I'll be sending out an email about our next meeting, which we're hoping to be in two months, and. Just once again, thank you, Peter, for an excellent, excellent presentation. It was very helpful. It's got me really thinking about what is our B in biodiversity in the M-bonds and what do we need it to mean with regards to ocean acoustics. Yeah, thank you so much. This is really excellent and I uh, appreciate it. Sure, no, I, and thanks all for helping organize this. I think in this crazy COVID time, it's great to be able to take advantage 
of times we can cross uh, geographic boundaries and disciplinary boundaries for this kind of conversation. So this is great. Wonderful. Thanks so much, everybody. And I'll be uh, ending everything now.